All right. Last time we talked about how Leander boundary layers behave from a conceptual standpoint. Now, today we're going to get into the underlying math uh, a little bit. Now, this isn't really a fluids class, um, but we're going to start by deriving or at least showing most of the steps that you would need to do to derive the governing partial differential equations uh, that describe a flowing fluid. So these include conservation of mass, which we call continuity. Uh, they include momentum equations in every coordinate direction, and then also energy. So we'll derive them, and then we will simplify them for the special case where we're applying them in a boundary layer. In a boundary layer, uh, we talked about boundary layers last time. Boundary layers are the situation that we care about most in this class, because boundary layers are that region that um, describe where a surface or a, a, an object is interacting with a flowing fluid. So in a heat transfer class, applying these partial differential equations in a boundary layer is our primary point. And these are, these are called then the boundary layer simplifications. So the steps that we're going to use to uh, derive these uh, fluid dynamic equations are no different really than the steps that we've used throughout the class in order to derive the governing differential equations that we have to use uh, to solve conduction problems. Right, so we've been, we've been balancing since I think day one of the class energy. So we'll draw uh, a differential control volume and we will balance a quantity, uh, what we've been balancing is energy, and we will um, expand uh, the x plus dx and the y plus dy terms and we'll make sure that we take advantage of the fact that dx and dy are becoming differentially small and uh, we end up then with a partial differential equation and we're going to go through exactly those same steps here uh, the only difference is that we are going to have to uh, balance things other than energy so we might be balancing mass uh, we might be um, enforcing uh, the momentum equation or uh, we will actually be balancing energy, but we'll have a few more terms. So we're going to stick with a 2D situation, two-dimensional situation. So our coordinate directions are going to be x and y. So we're not going to involve any changes in the z direction. And that means that our differential control volume that we're going to define uh, is going to be differentially small in x and differentially small uh, in y as shown here. And we're going to start by doing um, the simplest uh, one, which is a, a mass balance. So we're going to derive the continuity equation. Mass is a conserved quantity, and that means that uh, we can <coughs> write uh, in equals out plus stored. So we have to think about how mass can get into and out of this control volume, and then um, how much mass is stored. So in our two-dimensional flow situation we can have uh, velocities in both the x and the y direction so x direction is u and y direction is v so we can have um, a flow of mass across this control surface here on the left and that would be equal to um, u the x directed velocity times the area which is w times dy where w is going to be our width into the page so that's the volumetric flow rate, and then we multiply that by the density uh, rho, and we have the mass flow rate. So this is the, the mass flow rate into this left-hand side of this control volume. So we'll have the same quantity over here on the right-hand side, um, but that will be evaluated at x plus dx instead of at x. So we'll have the same uh, thing going on on the top and bottom surfaces. So uh, because we have fluid flowing in the y direction on the bottom surface here uh, we can have a mass flow entering and that would be uh, the v velocity so the y directed velocity times the area which is w times dx times rho and that's evaluated at location y and we would have the same term but up on the top surface at location y plus dy so we have our ins and our outs and all that's left then is our rate of storage of mass. So there's a, a rate of storage of mass within the control volume and that's equal to the time rate of change of the mass in the control volume, uh, which is the volume W times dx times dy uh, multiplied by the density. 
So then it's just a matter of taking each of these terms and putting them in the right place in the mass balance. So we have the ins, and then that equals the outs at x plus dx and y plus dy, and then the rate of storage, and that's what I've shown here. So next we need to expand the x plus dx term, and also here the y plus dy term. So we can write them in terms of their derivatives. And then we can uh, cancel out the terms that appear on both sides. Uh, and then we can divide by w times dx times dy. And you end up with the uh, continuity equation shown here. So this is an embodiment of mass conservation. And you can look at each of these terms and see where they come from. The first term is related to <coughs> mass crossing the boundary uh, moving from left to right, so in the x direction, and how that changes. Uh, the second is mass crossing the boundaries uh, from top to bottom, so um, up and down, and how that changes. And then the last one is mass stored inside of the uh, inside of the control volume. So if we restrict ourselves to fluids that are incompressible, then density is constant, and that allows us to simplify that even further. Uh, if density is constant, then um, even if the problem itself is transient, density can't be changing. So the, the, the derivative of density with respect to time must be equal to zero. Um, if density is constant, then the density that appear in both of these uh, derivatives could be pulled out. Um, and uh, you can divide through by density and you end up with this version of the continuity equation that's shown here. So this is the continuity equation for the incompressible fluid. Uh, even, if, even if the problem is transient, uh, there's still no time derivative because density uh, can't be changing with time. So the same kind of steps lead to the momentum equations. So we're going to derive here the x momentum equation first. Um, the y momentum equation would be <coughs> basically the same steps. Um, X momentum is not conserved like uh, energy or mass actually. Uh, X momentum is uh, balanced but it's balanced against X directed forces, right? So uh, if you've had a fluids class um, this equation might look familiar to you that uh, the rate of X momentum into a control volume plus the X directed forces on the control volume has to be equal to the rate of X momentum leaving the control volume and the rate of X momentum that's stored uh, in the control volume, right? So all of these things have to balance. So um, let's start with the same control volume and we're going to start with the momentum terms and then come back and do the force terms, the X force terms. <laughs> So any place that mass crosses the control volume, uh, that mass, uh, if it has any uh, u velocity, will have some x momentum, right? And the way to think about this is that uh, the x directed velocity u is just the uh, x momentum per unit mass. So over here on the left uh, control volume face, where we had some mass entering, which I've shown here. If I'd like to know how much x directed momentum is entering with that mass, it's uh, as simple as multiplying that mass flow rate uh, by u. So um, it goes from this term to uh, this term. And you can see that all this changes instead of having a u, now there's a u squared. Same term, but multiplied by u. Uh, on the other side of the control volume, then we will have the same term, uh, so the same x momentum rate. Uh, but it'll, it will be leaving and it will be evaluated at location uh, x plus dx. On the lower face of the control volume we had mass entering and it was v times w times dx times rho and we'll take that same term and multiply it by u and that's the x momentum entering down there. And then at the top face, we have the same term and uh, evaluated then at, at y plus dy. And that's the rate at which uh, x momentum is leaving the control volume through that top face. And then um, just like there is uh, the potential for mass storage inside the control volume, there will be the potential for x momentum storage. And that uh, x momentum storage rate is the... Uh, 
is the rate of change of the mass multiplied by u, uh, the extractive velocity. So these are all of the x-momentum terms that we'll have in our uh, x-momentum balance. And now we have to come back and try to uh, do the force terms. And there's a bunch of force terms. Um, a couple of them are pretty obvious. So um, the pressure forces. So on every face, we'll have a pressure force. Uh, we're only interested in the pressure forces on the left and right faces because those are the pressure forces that act uh, in the x-direction. So we're, here we have pressure times area. Uh, at location x and here we have the same thing at location x plus dx. Uh, potentially there could be a gravitational force so uh, that would be equal to the mass inside of the control volume multiplied by the um, component of the gravitational force in the x direction. So there's actually um, few more forces that we have to think about and these are uh, shear forces so on each face there's a shear force in each direction right so there's a total of four of these shear forces um, we're interested obviously only in the forces in the x direction so if we go to the y face so this would be the top and the bottom um, on these faces uh, there is a shear force both in the x and the y direction and we would be interested here uh, only in the uh, x-directed shear force on the y face. So that's uh, given the symbol tau y x. So the first subscript then indicates the face it acts on, and the second subscript indicates the direction that it acts. acts. So so tau y x is the shear force. Uh, it's shear in that it you know tends to distort the control volume. Um, you have to multiply that by an area. And of course, you have one both on the bottom face at location y, and then also on the top face uh, at location uh, y plus dy. So the x-directed force, the x-directed shear force that acts on the x face, is a normal force. It's called sigma uh, xx. So again, uh, x, uh, the first x indicates the face it acts on, and the second x indicates the direction it acts. Uh, it acts. So. Here uh, we would have sigma xx times an area uh, acting at location x, and on the other side we'd have the same thing but uh, acting at location x plus dx. So these are all of our terms. Um, there's quite a lot of them this time, um, but otherwise uh, it's pretty, pretty familiar in terms of the steps. We have to take each of these terms <coughs> and put them in the right spot in our momentum balance. So we would have um, the momentum in terms uh, have to equal the momentum out terms and then the rate of change of momentum. And then we also have all the positive extracted forces on the left side and then all the negative extracted forces uh, on the right side. So we'll do the same thing. We'll take all of the x plus dx, y plus dy terms, and we'll expand them and express them in terms of a derivative. And I, I guess we've done this enough to anticipate that uh, you'll be able to cancel uh, all of these terms out, and you'll only be left with the term that is related to the derivative. And we'll divide by um, w times dx times dy, and you'll be left with this equation here. So you can see where all of these different terms come from. Um, there's a pressure force. Uh, there's a, a, a normal viscous force. So this is uh, acting in the uh, x direction on the x face. There's a viscous shear stress that acts in the x direction on the y face. Uh, there's gravity. Then there's x momentum flowing um, in and out of the X faces and in and out of the Y faces and finally X momentum storage and all those terms when we put them together that becomes our uh, X momentum balance. So the last thing we have to do actually is uh, introduce some rate equations into this um, formula. So these viscous stresses are related to viscosity and, and um, and the velocity, just in the same way that uh, the diffusive heat transfer conduction is related to thermal conductivity and the temperature, right? So it's the same kind of thing where we're relating um, 
in this case, uh, these viscous shear stresses to velocity, and that's given by the law of viscosity. So these are the equations for the law of viscosity, and we would uh, introduce these equations uh, into this um, into this equation, and uh, we end up with uh, this equation that's shown here. Now, uh, to get from uh, point A to point B at this point is actually um, a little bit more than algebra and that you have to do a couple of kind of clever non-intuitive tricks that involve the chain rule and involve using continuity equation but uh, if you're very interested in that you can certainly see that in the book uh, in the end though these are algebraically equivalent and this is the form of the equation that we typically um, that we typically use and it's uh, sometimes referred to as uh, the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, if we go through uh, pretty much exactly the same procedure, you would get uh, this equation, which is the y-momentum equation. So if you stare at this for a little bit, you can see um, where each of these terms come from. You, know, you have uh, y-momentum terms. <coughs> so these are the, the rates of y-momentum coming in. Um, through the x-directed phases and then through the y-directed phases and the rate of y-momentum stored inside of the system. You have uh, pressure forces, you have viscous forces, and then you have gravitational force. And these, for these equations together are called the Navier-Stokes equations.